Hello everybody, welcome to Millennium 7 Star, the channel that helps you make sense of military history and military technology. Welcome to another experiment in which I will ramble about some subject with no edit for some time, going through a list of something. And today, for our ramble, we are using this book. It is The World's Greatest Aircraft uh, by Christopher Chant, a book of 2006 that I bought some time ago, which I believe is an excellent book. And by the way, this is not a sponsored um, video, so just think it is a good book that I had around. So what we are going to do is going through the list of the post-war fighters, jet fighters, and say something about them. So, well, I suppose that the book starts with Messerschmitt 262, which is not really post-war, and uh, it has seen no action after the war, uh, but yeah, I suppose it still needs to be there because, well, it's the father, I suppose. Then we have the Gloucester Meteor, which is uh, probably the, yeah, it is probably the first British jet to enter service and see some form of operational service. Um, uh, maybe an interesting thing to know about this plane is that still today there is one in use, Martin Baker, the um, uh, ejection seat manufacturer still uses a Gloucester Meteor to test uh, he, their ejection seats. So yes, it's very particular. Lockheed F-80 shooting star and T-33, which are basically the same plane. The T-33 is obviously the jet trainer. So this is um, probably the first um, operational American jet fighter. I believe it didn't see um, action in the First World War, but it has seen a lot of action during the Korean War. Um, there is an interesting uh, uh, episode, there is an interesting story told by Chuck Higger in his biography um, when he says that at some point he used to do some demonstration, air show demonstration using the shooting star, which was a, a new plane at the time. And he used, before starting the plane, he used to place an Iron Man with a torch just beside the jet engine and then it turned the jet engine on and the crowd thought that it was the airman with the torch who had pretty much light the engine which is well i suppose sort of funny okay the Havilland, the h100 the 113 and 115 vampires well vampire is another piece of genius from the Havilland, and uh, yeah, twin boom, very peculiar, small, quick, maneuverable, great plane. I've seen um, it from up close at Duxford, uh, Imperial War Museum, and uh, yeah, they they really look cool. Do you realize that they are really machine built for the pilot? Republic F-84 family, okay, this is um, another post-war jet, this time more oriented for the ground attack. Mm, it is quite interesting, I mean it was a cornerstone of the um, uh, tactical aeronautics, tactical aviation, tactical forces uh, in uh, the 50s. It also has seen service in Italy, my country, when the 
uh, the Italian Air Force was being rebuilt, received um, a lot of F-50 uh, flown uh, with the F-84 for quite a long time. Mikoyan Gurevich MiG-15 Thagat, and yes, this is the big uh, enemy of the beginning of the Cold War, the, the big enemy over the skies uh, in of Korea. Uh, I don't know if a lot of you guys know, but the engine that was powering the plane was derived by a British engine. So the NEN with turbo turbojet, which was among the first turbojets produced by Rolls-Royce, was sold to USSR among a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of discussions and a lot of argument. It was a very controversial sale. Well, because Britain needed foreign cash. <coughs> well, you can say that it didn't turn out to be such a great idea. North American F-86 Sabre, and yes, this is a legend, the first real jet fighter and one of the last of the real fighters, of one of the last cannon fighters, again, cornerstone in Korea, cornerstone of different air forces. Um, yeah, great plane, great plane, beautiful. And quite interesting, it used a radar, uh, was, uh, yeah, there have been application of the radar on fighters before, the Germans did a lot, but also other nations. But uh, it was interesting that the F-86 had the radar not to locate the target, but just to measure the distance, which was useful to set the, the pressure on um, the aim, no? on, um, and uh, yes, to improve the shooting. Okay, Saab 29, Sweden, also called Tunan. Uh, yeah, which sounds like something big and fat. Yes, and this plane looked big and fat. This was uh, something that the Swedish, I believe, should be very proud of because that was the plane that allowed Sweden to stay in the game of advanced uh, fighter jets. And uh, yes, maybe it was not the best plane in the world, but definitely played a role. Uh, in uh, maintaining this kind of continuity and allowing the Swedish to go on toward uh, better and higher places. Hooker Hunter, um, yeah, oh my gosh, we are talking about <laughs> cornerstone of the history of the aviation. So the Hooker Hunter was again a fighter um, post-war fighter of the 50s and early 60s and uh, it was the first British fighter to be supersonic in a sort of a shallow dive and this will be one of the strange things that happened with British jets for a while, in the, say in the 50s and 60s, while other well, I mean the Americans, were capable of, star of producing supersonic jets uh, that were capable of using their supersonic speed in fractal operations. The British had a lot of problems um, creating planes capable of doing that and they got there a bit later. It's quite strange to be honest. The Soul Mister and Super Mister. I remember I made a model of the Super Mister when I was a child. As the <coughs> uh, sorry, as the Tunan for Sweden, the Mister was um, the first, let's say, the first really successful, the first really produced um, French plane after the war 
was a fighter, he was an excellent plane, an excellent fighter to, in the duel with the F-86, uh, performed very, very, very well. So please, no humor about baguette and stuff like that. The French, the French normally do good stuff. Convert F-102 Delta Dagger and F-106 Delta Dart. Okay, this is, was the America's take to the Delta Wing. I believe these were beautiful, beautiful planes. I remember being very, very young and watching pictures of these planes and thinking, oh my gosh, what, what are they? What are those? They're incredible. They're really beautiful, which I still think today. Um, I think that the well, a part of the aerodynamics that that okay, that was uh, well, the French mastered it, um, but I mean, the United States was uh, no less. Uh, I think that what is interesting is that we are starting here with that sort of thinking that say that if you have guided missiles, uh, then at the end of the day, you don't really need cannons which I think is not true, and with me a lot of people think that is not true, is not even going to be true today with Stealth and F-35, so yeah, this is the beginning of a sort of dead end that is coming back and again, times and again, no? keeps coming back, no, the missiles will replace the cannons, the missiles will replace the cannons, intelligence weapons will replace uh, normal kinetic weapons and blah, 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 blah. And at the end of the day, never happens. And if it happens, the first operations actually disprove this. Vought F-8 Crusader. This was dubbed the last of the fighters because it was probably the one of the last fighters that were built to, um, let's say, to, to fight mainly with the cannons. It, well, I mean, the most interesting characteristic is the wing, which can actually pop out because um, to change, it, let's say, its angle of attack while landing. It's, uh, yeah, it's, a, very, um, it's a very peculiar solution. Uh, well, it's difficult to explain without a drawing, uh, but basically to avoid tail strikes and uh, keeping the fuselage streamlined, um, they needed higher angle of attack to land on uh, the carrier. <coughs> Sorry. So they decided to, well, basically change the angle of attack of the whole wing, making it, making it uh, mobile. And mobile, not like this, which we are all familiar, but like, if, the, if this is the fuselage, this is the wing, the wing does this. Plip, so comes up. Very neat, very interesting. Sudest SO4050 Votour. Okay, I believe that not many of you will remember this plane, but this plane, um, more than a fighter, was um, a light bomber. It was a jet bomber, one of the first jet bombers that came out in uh, this era. Plan machine of the same class as the Canberra or um, some Russian planes. Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, okay, I've, in the video about the Aspida missile, we talked a lot about the F-104 Starfighter. It was a machine that was never loved by anyone but the Italians. And uh, yes, that's it, it's beautiful. I still remember the first time I saw one. Again, I was a child and it was such a marvelous view. It was so... So I was there. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh my god! This is beautiful. This is, this is what a plane should be. Okay. 
Um, yes, I understand all the problems. I know all the problems. I know that everything that has happened and the fact that this machine killed a lot of people. But yeah, in Italy we were able to have it uh, do and perform well in a number of roles that appear to be incredible, in which I believe that the art of um, making do is something that we Italians really have. Okay. <coughs> Republic F104 Tanzu Chief. Yep. This is the prototype of the attack plane. And was mean it is another staple of the history of aviation. Had its um, or, I mean, and it has had heyday during the Vietnam War where it was used to bomb North Vietnam and everything else. It uh, What I like about this plane was the fact that it was a plane that you can see, if you look at it, that it is designed for attack. You can see straight away that it's going to have a very high wind load. This means that it's going to be very stable at low altitude, it's not going to suffer a lot from turbulence. And in an age where you don't have, uh, an age when you don't have um, intelligent weapons, I mean, stability of the launching platform is very important. Even the wing is very thick, and this is important because when you release the bombs, uh, the wing gets a big buffet and if it starts vibrating the second bomb that you uh, deliver from the pylon is going yeah, to go off target and the overall precision of the whole bombs being released of the whole salvo uh, of bombs being released will be lower so you need a very thick a very stiff uh, complex wing plus pylon and this plane had so it could have uh, it could have been very very precise. Also, if you look at the fuselage from the top, you can see that it uh, has the area rules. It uses the area rules. It is maxed, so penetrate so low altitude, high speed. Definitely a great, um, definitely uh, a great combination. Sub 35 Draken, beautiful machine, beautiful, beautiful machine. Such an interesting aerodynamic formula, double delta. This is the precursor of all that stuff about lifting body, non-linear lift, all these kind of things. This is thinking out of the box at its best. I always been curious about this machine. I always liked it. Uh, probably had less success than it deserved uh, because it was Swedish. But yeah, it was great. Just a curiosity, it was pretty much, I think, the only machine, the only fighter outside the United States to use the Falcon generation missile, which is, well, considering the performance of the Falcons, that's definitely not a good idea, but yeah, you know, nobody's perfect. Oh, the Sol Mirage 3 and Yaikfer, France and Israel, I see why, I can see why they put together. So obviously the Mirage 3 is another historical, incredibly famous jet, another staple of the history of aeronautics uh, in the 60s and the 70s um, sold to a number of uh, sort of numberless countless countries uh, fought in different roles very adaptable maybe not a lot of um, maybe not a lot of payload but definitely beautiful plane great performance um, great mastery of the delta wing and the Kfir, which is a bit less known, it was the Israeli version. And um, 
actually at some point, so France at some, was selling the Mirage 3 to Israel. Then there was a change of politics and uh, they decided not to sell. Then the Mossad, the uh, Israeli Secret Service, pretty much stole the drawings of the Mirage 3 and brought them to Israel. And the result was the Kfir, which was basically a, well, a copy, the Mirage 3. Looks slightly different, the nose is slightly different because the radar was different, but the, um, yeah, it's basically the same plane. I think that Argentina bought some Kfir when Israel was uh, decommissioning them, which is, which is curious, I believe. Okay, Mikoyan Gurevich, MiG-21 Fishbad, USSR. Again, the, the big enemy, the, greater, the greatest enemy of the F-4 in the skies of Vietnam. It's a machine that they don't like very much because it has a delta wing and a conventional tail, um, which I don't know, I've never fully understood why they have chosen this configuration, but um, yeah, definitely an historical machine. The Indians still uh, use it, a very modernized version. A lot of aeronautics still use it in a very modernized version with modern avionics and so on, but yet this had proved to be very um, proved to be very resistant to 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 age, you know. It age it, it is aging very slowly. I mean, the cells, the, um, the 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 airframes are aging very slowly, which is quite interesting for a Russian product. Okay, English Electric Lightning. Okay, um, I don't think there could be anything more English or British than this because, well, it uses all sorts of um, interesting solution. uses a wing that may seem a um, delta wing with a clip, but it's not. Uh, the engines are one on top of the other. Very short autonomy. It was basically um, uh, used to, to bring a couple of air-to-air -air missiles uh, in a high altitude, near a bomber, shoot them, and then go back. So uh, it was an interceptor, what is, let's say, this <coughs> a similar role of the F-102, F-106, F and F-104, with this was, say, the British interpretation of the same role, the interceptor, which is a plane which is basically works like a missile with a man on it. McDonnell Douglas F4 Phantom. Okay, this is this is it. This is the most important plane of after the Second World War. Um, most important military plane after the Second World War for the kind of number of product produced, the kind of impact that it had, the kind of lesson that were mm, obtained from it, the kind of um, technical solutions that were used, it became the benchmark of everybody else. So, yes. Uh, how you cannot like this one. <coughs> and note in the first version, and again in the first version of this one, this idea that, yeah, cannons are not really necessary anymore. Yeah, it was coming back. Northrop F5. Okay, this is the foreign fighter. That is, when the United States were not particularly keen to sell their best planes to other countries, or there were third world countries that didn't need a high specification plane, a frontline fighter for their necessity. Yeah, then there was the F-5. Again, it's a plane that was sold in so many units. I have seen 
them flying in Switzerland. Uh, that still believe is I believe they're still flying them just for air policing um, tasks because they today they pretty much have no 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 fighting value or almost no fighting value and um, yeah a lot of the people actually a lot of pilots learn their things learn to fly jets on this kind of plane so yes again very very interesting um, another quite interesting element it, it was probably the first plane to have small leading edge extension so maybe enjoying a little bit of non-linear lift that's quite interesting Mikoyan MiG-25 Fox Bat this is Ruski and this is the Soviet interpretation of the Interceptor the fastest plane in the world for a while capable of reaching Mach uh, 2.8 um, not really practical speed anyway but um, they could do that so it, obviously it was built to be an interceptor over the largest the large spaces that the United Soviet Union has in the Arctic to try to stop the bombers um, that's the reason why it was so quick as a fighter itself yes was not a particularly good plane but yes it was remarkable for the speed and the achievement it is uh, and it is a beautiful machine I really I really like it and um, then uh, yeah then the, the intersector role became done better by the surface to air missiles but well people realized that being very quick but maybe being a bit more maneuverable with a bit more autonomy and a bit more sophistication was actually useful so the MiG-31 is still in use in the, in the Russian Air Force and in the Indian Air Force which is uh, really interesting um, they are they do reconnaissance mostly but they still have some offensive capability after all it is very difficult to um, shoot a target that flies so quick and if a target that flies so quick can launch a long-range missile at you yeah maybe there's something to worry about a Mikoyan MiG-23 and MiG-27 flogger so this plane is actually remarkable because it, will be, it was built in a lot of units but it was definitely outclassed by everything the West was going to throw at it so um, yes it is important because uh, yes there, there are quite a lot of them around like a bit fewer than the MiG-21s but it was sort of like the MiG-21 but it was nowhere near as um, effective, nowhere near as a, an accomplished machine as the MiG-21. Sorry I had to stop because uh, all sorts of batteries uh, died uh, pretty much all together. But yes, we keep going. So Sub-37 Vegan, we were saying Delta Wing. Uh, plus canard, large canards, uh, definitely a great plane, like most of the stuff that the Swedish do, um, yeah, not conventional, but doing great. Another of the, those planes that actually would have deserved a bit better, if it was an American solution, it would have been probably uh, up there with the F4 or one of the best Grumman F14 Tomcat okay who hasn't seen Top Gun um, when I entered university well Top Gun was just came out so yeah uh, you know that the F14 uh, I believe you know that the F14 is pretty much a second thought in the sense that it was a mashup of a failed project that was supposed to have 
uh, just um, one plane, one platform to satisfy the Navy, uh, the Air Force and the Marines necessity and to have uh, the, uh, and the, the plane was supposed to cover the, the fighter role and also the bomber role, the land attack role and obviously miserably failed because the requisites are totally incompatible with one another. Okay, I'm not talking about this anymore, any longer, but yeah, F-14, beautiful. I have been, I remember when I was a boy, I was presented with a book that was called uh, Wings Over Sea, uh, or, better, or Wings Over the Ocean, sorry, Wings Over the Ocean, that was a photo book about the F-14, and it was amazing. I spent a Christmas day, pretty much, reading it, watching it, try to look at all the details of the plane, try to figure out what they were for, what they were used for, what they meant, why there was, why there was a slot there, why there was an air intake there, why, what's that, writing over there what does it mean and so on the other interesting thing is that probably the f-14 was one of the first plane to have an infrared search and track quite a primitive thing built to let's say complement the long-range camera that they had because they were supposed to be able to recognize and visually identify the Soviet bombers from afar without getting close, not to lose the advantage of the long range of the Phoenix missile. But um, yeah, that's quite interesting. Infrared search and track is becoming increase, increasingly important sensor for planes today. And I believe the United States is slightly, slightly late to that. Um, to that train. The Sol Mirage F1. Um, well, the workhorse. Yeah, the it's good plane, reliable, and um, yes, like most of the French stuff. Um, please stop thinking about baguettes and these kind of things. Like most of the French stuff, um, really reliable, well designed, well thought of, very effective. I have seen these in Greece, in Crete. I was in on holiday with my girlfriend at the time. I was very young. It was probably the first time I I went on holiday with a girlfriend, and we used to be woken up sort of six in the morning by Mirage F1 taking off from the Iraqian airport. She was terribly pissed. I loved it. McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle, United States. Well, do I really need to say anything? Because the Eagle is the air dominance fighter personified. Quick, maneuverable, good sensor, good weapons, good autonomy, pretty much good everything. What would you like? What would you like most? What, what, what's there not to like? Do you know the story that apparently an Israeli pilot managed to land an F-15 without a wing because they, they had a collision in flight when pretty much remained with a meter or so of wing from one side, but using the tailerons, the, um, the fly-by-wire system was actually able to compensate because obviously it's a lifting, it's a lifting body, the F-15, and um, I was able to compensate and I realized that it was still able to maneuver and uh, yeah, he managed to land and the plane was repaired and enters um, service uh, again. A great thing. I thoroughly support the idea of actually having the F-15X um, for the US Air Force as a weapon carrier. That's definitely a good, good idea. 
Lockheed Martin F F-16 fighting Falcon. Okay, the F-16 has been the, yes, another staple of modern air forces, at least Western air forces. The, um, what I think is interesting about the F-16 is not its genesis, which was about the light fighter, very maneuverable, maybe without even a radar, and so on and so on and so on. But, turned out to become a very effective plane when uh, this idea of the light fighter was abandoned. When this uh, good airframe became capable of accommodating all sorts of improvements, uh, better engines and better avionics, better system to become well-balanced uh, weapon. The thing that actually leaves me a little bit, um, a little bit, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not sure if it is a good thing or not, is the fact that there were so many F-16 around that, um, well, what, I mean, if you have no variety among your forces, yes, maybe you the opponent can find a single countermeasure which is actually able to neutralize your your weapons or your systems uh, otherwise if you have various systems with similar performances similar effectiveness you may be able to yeah if something is outclassed or is not is actually not being uh, effective anymore because a countermeasure has been found that yeah, you still have something else which is actually working. So it was this kind of uniformity because, well, the Israelis went their way as they usually do, but the, the rest of the West, they were very similar, uh, different level of, uh, let's say, different level of improvements, different blocks, you no, know, but I mean, among those, they were very similar. So um, yeah, it was a having the same plane, not just in one air force, not just being the, the main plane of a single air force, of the largest air force, but all of the other air forces, maybe is inherently unsafe up to a point. I mean, in nature we observe that ecosystem they have the largest variations, the most variations, tend to be also the most resilient. I don't know, maybe it's just me rambling and maybe I'm just worrying for nothing. I won't mention more on the plane. Boeing, Mac, McDonnell Douglas FA-18 Hornet. Um, yep. The brother of the F-16, or the cousin, but the, of the F-16, originated by so same period with the same specifications, which is definitely what, not what the U.S. Navy needed, particularly about the range of this plane, um, and particularly the choice of basing the uh, air wings entirely on the, F, uh, on the F-18, well, in a world where you don't have near-peer opponents, well, that's fine, probably doesn't matter much, but this is no longer the world we live in. Uh, China and Russia are closing the gap very, very quickly, and uh, yeah, don't know. Um, Variety again. MiG 29 Fulcrum. Okay, the MiG 29, I've seen it the first time at Le Bourget many years ago. It was an incredible impression. It was the loudest plane I have ever heard. Violence at pure state. Uh, very, very interesting aerodynamic formula, very interesting. Some say that there is um, some level of derivation from the F-14, but I don't think so, to be honest. It's uh, I mean, just similar solution to similar problems. 
it is uh, that having said that uh, the plane was nothing special. The, the systems were lacking. Probably the new F-35, sorry F-35, the, the, the new MiG-35, which is being produced now, is going to close the gap on the same airframe with better engines and better everything. But um, the original plane wasn't definitely anything special. Uh, it was Normally there is this kind of parallel that the MiG-29 is the equivalent of the F-16 and the Sukhoi-27 is the equivalent of the F-15. While it is true for the Sukhoi, the MiG-29 in all of his version mostly lagged behind the F-16. But for one thing, it was one of the first planes to use an infrared search and track in an integrated way with the radar wasn't very efficient, at least so say pilots, but yes, it was the right direction because today it's become increasingly common. And Sukhoi 27 flanker, larger plane, uh, probably, uh, I mean, probably the best of non-stealth planes best in terms of pure performance, aerodynamic performance, uh, refinement of the aerodynamic formula, which is great. Um, well, it has, uh, it is going through the same kind of development that is now common in the West, where you build one airframe and you keep for 50 years or 40 years and just keep updating it. So went through an, an, a numberless, um, numberless versions, different versions for different countries with different, different levels. And um, yes, the um, was very feared, was feared definitely and very respected by the F-15 pilots. Um, they thought it was borderline nightmare for them. Um, yeah, um, the latest incarnations are with vector trust, modern avionics, uh, modern weapons are still very, very effective. And yeah, definitely is a Russian product, which is basically up there with the best non-stealth planes uh, today. It's a, plane, it's a plane that I really, really like. The Soul Mirage 2000. Okay, this is the Mirage 3 done right. Another workhorse of the French Air Force. Um, has been combat proven, did very well. There is an interesting episode in which in Central Africa, French Mirage pretty much saved um, some American special forces during the fight. And apparently the Americans were a little bit pissed about that, but yeah, things that may happen. What I think is outstanding about Mirage 2000 that that plane was at the the star of a French film, a French movie, The Chevalier du Ciel, a few years ago, which is if you if you don't follow the story because that doesn't really mean anything. Um, it is even better than Top Gun. It is a beautiful, beautiful film. On YouTube there is the trailer, which is a very long trailer. Look for it, watch it, you won't regret it. Sub Gripen, yes, 39. Yep, and this is my favorite modern plane. It is my favorite modern plane because yes, it is inferior to some respects to our other modern fighters of the same class. It is, could, should be more correctly classed as a light fighter, but a light fighter with very sharp teeth, particularly now that it uses the Meteor missile, which is a game changer or near game changers in the air-to-air -air arena. 
It is a plane built around the um, uh, countermeasure, the electronic countermeasure, the ECM system, which apparently is deadly effective and can be maintained by four conscript on a makeshift motorway maintenance hut which is probably the most important quality a plane should have so you can buy a grip <coughs> considering that is not also shows you can buy grip and you can buy a large fleet of grip and considering that is not very very expensive and uh, keep operating with an effective plane for a very long time because you have dispersed it everywhere and it doesn't really need a lot of technical support that's a great thing as usual well done sweden and we finish with the lock and martin f22 raptor well still today the unrivaled air-to-air -air combat machine and mine it's not because of the stealth don't get me wrong stealth is important and provides a great advantage uh, but it is stealth but it is also built as a fighter it also has the performance and the equipment of a fighter so even though it wasn't stealth it was still dominate still dominate maybe a bit less be used with different tactics but it will still dominate the airspace probably probably the only plane that gets close is the french rafale and the, the russian su-35 they're the only planes that can get sort of close um the Eurofighter doesn't. It's a, it's a small is a step behind. Um small step, but a step behind. So um, yeah. Hope you have enjoyed this chat. I hope you enjoyed my memories. So yes, please let me know in the comments below if there's anything you would like me to focus on and, and do a proper video, normal video about and um, yes so thank you very much for watching watch the videos around me please and goodbye